Hello and welcome to Windows in Time, A Corset Won't Kill You, Demystifying the 19th Century Women's Wardrobe, presented by Jackson County Library Services and the Southern Oregon Historical Society. I am Leah Pasizo, Digital Services Specialist. This program is being recorded, so please mute your microphone and turn off your camera to ensure quality recording. There will be a time to answer your questions at the end of the program. Jackson County Library Services acknowledges that its libraries are located within the traditional lands of the Shasta, Tekelma, and Lakawa people, whose descendants are now identified as members of the Confederated Tribes of Sunets Indians and Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, as well as of the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Tribe of Indians and Modoc Nation, who were forced to relocate to Oklahoma. We take this moment to recognize the indigenous peoples whose traditional lands are where residents of Jackson County live today. JCLS is committed to fostering understanding, deep respect, and honor for Indigenous people, and we encourage you to learn more about the land you reside on. For more information, go to jcls.org land. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Jackson County Library Services. And now I'll hand it off to Larry. Good afternoon. Uh, next month, our featured speaker is Robert Herning, who's going to speak on railroading in Southern Oregon. That's April 3rd here and April 10th in Ashland. Same time, same place. And uh, it'll be a PowerPoint presentation. And we look forward to it. Uh, we have a set, a set of uh, coming events, and uh, many of you are volunteers, or I know you might be interested, you should be interested in perhaps uh, promoting history in different ways, and one of these may be your way. Uh, to actually sign up to do any of them, you go online to SOHS.org and then look under volunteers and there's a form you fill out and, and people will contact you. So the first of these is our annual membership meeting, which is more like a party than a, a work piece. And that's March 17th. And that's upstairs in the old Jacksonville courthouse, which has a lot of memories for SOHS. In fact, SOHS is attributed with having preserved that building from, from the knackers or the knockers. Okay. On the um, 16th of the farm, there's a nice outdoor exercise day and training. That's April 6th. Excuse me. On April 6th. On April 27th, 28th is the first major event of the season. That's the Heritage Plant Sale. And this always needs a good number of Helpers. There's a pre-sale for society members Saturday from 10 to 11. And then on uh, between May 13th and 24th, so we're out now two months, uh, Children Heritage Fair. Um, this is uh, through most of the week in the mornings. Needs lots of volunteers. It's fourth graders, and they're exploring facets of Oregon Trail life uh, or the people of those times. And there's hundreds of them. And uh, this is something they all look forward to. They're not all there exactly the same time and they move in groups. So each group is about 20 students or sometimes a few more, but it's it's very well organized and orchestrated. Today, I'm happy to introduce Cassidy Houseman Mason. Each year, the society tries to select one student from Southern Oregon University to be our featured speaker. This year we're fortunate in that the speaker we've chosen, Cassidy, is also one of our important volunteers at the Han Hanley Archives or the Hanley Collections. Uh, for the past year, she's done two very special projects for SOHS. As a historic textile expert, she went through the SOHS textile collection looking for items that were dyed with arsenic dyed. dyed. And she'll say a little more about that in her talk. And needless to say, that's something to, good to know about the, the pieces in your collection that were um, developed that way. The other major contribution was at last summer's Living History Program, where she brought to life Claire Hanley as she might have been in the 1920s. So here today, without any further delay, uh, are the intriguing, under the intriguing title of Corsets, Corsets Won't Kill You, is Cassidy's lesson in Victorian fashion. Cassidy? Thank you very much, Larry. Hello, everyone, and welcome to A Course It Won't Kill You, demystifying the 19th century women's wardrobe. Before we get properly started, I'd like to take a moment to get to just gauge our general level of understanding here. So show of hands, how many of you would consider yourselves 
at all versed in fashion history. I see one, two, three, three hands. All right. Would anyone here consider themselves a seamstress, a costumer, a textile artist? Anyone who knits, crochets, etc. I know one person here who crochets, but they're not raising their hand. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's do some let's do some free associations just to get the ball rolling. Unless it gets too chaotic, no need to raise your hand here. Just shout it out. What comes to mind when I say Victorian fashion? Whalebone corsets. Whalebone corsets. Long dresses and skirts. Lace. Woolen bathing suits. Woolen bathing suits. <laughs> Petticoats. What comes to mind, adjectives otherwise, when I just say the word corset? Tight. Tight, pain. Smelling salts. Smelling salts. <laughs> All right. So there are a lot of assumptions and preconceptions and stereotypes when it comes to the 19th century. But what I want to emphasize right away is that the people who lived in the 19th century were people. And a lot of the things that contributed to the clothing that they wore are the th same things that contribute to what we wear today. They wanted to look stylish. They wanted to be practical to some degree. They wanted maybe even comfort. First up, this is one of my favorite little games. This is a fashion plate from somewhere in the 1800s. Once again, no need to raise your hand. I'd like you to guess when this was made. You will get credit for a decade. 1880. I've heard 1820, I've heard 1880. Do we have any other guesses? <laughs> Bingo, 1860s. We had two people get it right. Congratulations. All right. Let's lay out some foundations. <laughs> so when we talk about a chemise, we might also call it a shift or a smock. A chemise was a very, very plain, often linen underdress. It was the layer worn closest to the skin. And the drawers, you might know as bloomers or pantaloons, drawers are the ancestors of modern underwear. These would be, as I said, the closest layer to the skin. They are there for your comfort and also to protect your outer layers from the oils from your body. The corset should never ever be worn directly against the skin. If you ever see a movie in which the corset is against the skin, it is wrong. It is also important to realize that the corset is the fu functional equivalent of the modern bra. It had a purpose beyond just being painful. The, the corset supports the bust and helps distribute the weight of the skirt adding additional back support. I own five corsets. As someone who's worn both corsets and bras, I'd prefer a corset. The petticoat is a skirt worn under your outer skirt to help support the weight. The crinoline and bustle, you see the crinoline here with on the image with the blue corset and the bustle on the other are both um, support garments that use metal hooping to help extend the shape of the skirt and prop it up. We'll be talking more about crinolines and bustles later as we get into the eras within the 19th century in which they were worn. Our next important term is survivorship bias. We have this idea of women in the 19th century that they were all teeny tiny, and that they were all wearing these elegant silks all the time. This is not true. These are just the dresses that we have left behind. The dresses worn by the everyday woman were worn and worn and worn until they were rags, at which point they were made into something else and worn and worn and worn until they were rags and then they were used as rags. Here we have some images of the everyday. We have a new person of the everyday woman, something that would not be in this lecture because these dresses disintegrated over time. We call this survivorship bias. And without further ado, to understand the 19th century, you need to understand how we got here. 
Fashion is always reaction. The way we present ourselves in the world is a reflection of the world we live in. And the beginning of the 19th century was a very politically tumultuous time. In, in the year 1800, America was younger than I am. French Revolution was 10 years past. Suddenly, it wasn't cool to look like Marie Antoinette anymore. Skirts got narrower. The waistline got higher. The stays, which is the ancestor of the modern corset, almost died out. We almost got a version of events in which the 19th century didn't have corsets. That didn't happen. The Regency came in um, in the 1790s, technically, but we really are talking about this period from 1800 to about 1830, where um, King George III was in mental decline and his son took over as king as prince regent you can see a first of all they're not all white dresses when we think of regency we often think of jane austen we think of these flowy white muslin gowns this was not always the case so that was a popular style you had bright color and as the decades wore on getting from 1805 all the way up to the early like late 1820s early 30s things get poofier this the Skirts get wider, the sleeves get fluffier, the waistlines get lower again. You get more of that corseted shape. Going right into the 1830s. <laughs> this has become one of my favorite decades of costuming simply because it is so bizarre. Um, you would often have extra pieces of underwear that would be either stuffed with horsehair or, or cotton or whatever you had, supporting the weight of the sleeves to keep them that puffy. Um, <laughs> the 1830s was also a beginning of what we call a corded petticoat, which is the ancestor of the hoop skirt. This was a petticoat that was stiffened with rope to make it, well, stiff, to help it support the weight of the skirts. But to get this shape, women started wearing more and more petticoats, making their garments heavier and heavier. Of all the decades, this would be one of the least comfortable to wear. So until this point, I haven't been using Victorian, right? What is a Victorian dress? Queen Victoria was crowned in 1837. So technically, anything before that date is not Victorian. It is what we can call Georgian, mostly. It is also important to remember that Victoria was very German and her husband was very German. So the sensibilities from the 1830s were replaced by an age of austerity. Although the skirts did continue to balloon with the use of more and more petticoats. If you've heard of Amelia Bloomer and that brief mid 19th century idea of Maybe women should wear trousers. It came here when skirts were ridiculously heavy with the number of petticoats one was wearing. This didn't last, however. In 1856, the hoop skirt was invented. A lot of people, like the corset, will think of the hoop skirt as an implement of female oppression. This is incorrect. The hoop skirt will take 10 petticoats that could weigh like 20 pounds and reduce it to about six pounds. The hoop skirt is not rigid, it squishes. You can get through narrow places, you can get downstairs, it's fine. And your dress is now a lot more comfortable. And beyond that, it's a lot more, less expensive because fabric is expensive in this era. Getting 10 to 20 petticoats costs a lot getting one hoop skirt, now that can be done, which helped to close the gap between different social classes in terms of the fashionable silhouette. I think the, the 1850s is really fun. This tiered skirt has become emblematic of this decade. You can also see here that the waistline, especially in this middle one, the waist is very close to the natural waist. It is lowered. This begins to change in the 1860s. You can see the waistline rises up again. And something interesting here happens with the hoop skirt. It's been around for a little bit. Designers are experimenting. In the 1850s, you see a perfectly circular hoop when you see hoops. 
by the 1860s, it be begins to become an oval with the weight of the dress pushed to the back. This is a much more aerodynamic design. Yes, indeed. But also fabric is expensive and different cuts of dresses were used for different occasions. You might see um, the middle garment here has a lower neckline. It shows a bit of decolletage. It doesn't have sleeves. That's an evening dress. That's what you would wear to a ball. These outer dresses are day dresses, much more modest. Your higher necklines, your arms are covered. So do they get new dresses for every time of day? Of course not. They had transformation gowns. One skirt, three or four bodices. You could have save so much money, so much fabric, and have a dress for every occasion. It is cool, right? This was a trend throughout most of the 19th century, but it really picked up here. So skirts have been getting bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more ostentatious. And then the 70s hits, and this idea of pushing the weight to the back goes even further and they abandon the hoop skirt in favor of the bustle. They, however, designers are now trying to show with a smaller skirt, they can have your skirts be just as ostentatious, just as many frills, just as many bows. Don't panic, it's just a few fewer yards of fabric. And chemical dyes are becoming more and more available. I love this fuchsia movine dyed gown from, I believe, 18... I think that is an 1871 gown, if I remember. I think this is from the Met Collection. Um, this sort of, like, bright purple is something we associate more with the modern day than with the 19th century. There is... But it's important to remember, people back then liked color. They liked color a lot. They liked glitz and glam. Um, if they had, like... If they had access to the neon dyes we did had today, it would be a nightmare. <laughs> but as the skirts got smaller and the designer started flexing that they could do plenty with less work fabric to work with, they decided to take that to its logical extreme. From about 1877 to 1883, fashion got weird again. And by weird, I mean narrow. The natural form sits kind of infuriatingly, right in the middle of the bustle era. Suddenly, skirts were incredibly tight to the body. And this was kind of hated in its day, primarily by men. Um, everyone had something to say about the natural form dresses. They were very ostentatious, plenty of ruffles, plenty of drapes, plenty going on. And they were just seen as weird. This was published in 1878 in a newspaper. <laughs> you can, there was a thriving art form of joking about and satir satirizing fashion as it was coming out. <laughs> and then, after a little bit of nonsense with the natural form, the bustle came back. However, it was changed. You might have noticed in the 1870s, the bustle is very soft shape. There is a lot of flowing lines, a lot of ruffle, a lot of, well, curves. The 1880s is geometric. You have this almost shelf-like bustle. The emphasis on the design is interesting pleats, geometric lines, sculptural details, fine tailoring. Also, the waistline lowers again. That's something that happens throughout the 19th century. The waistline rises and lowers and rises and lowers to the point where one of the best ways to identify a 19th century dress is where the waist is sitting. So who's heard of Charles Frederick Worth before or the House of Worth? We have one, we have two. So Charles Frederick Worth is often considered the father of haute couture. He was a designer in Paris. He opened his ha couture house in 1858, rose to prominence through the late 1860s, and stayed there until about the 1920s. He designed for royalty. He designed for nobility. He designed for the richest of the rich. 
And this is a small sampling of his work. Um, this yellow dress is one of his earlier pieces. This is from, I believe, 1867. Um, the white dress with the flowers is mid-1880s, and the black and white dress, my personal favorite, is known affectionately as the ironwork gown, and it was sewn between 1898 to 1900. You're going to see Worth gowns smattered throughout the rest of this presentation. The 1890s. The final decade of the 19th century is often known as the gay 90s. It was a time of fun. Women got a lot more adventurous. Um, I did not actually include any 1890s bicycling costumes in this presentation. However, the bicycle was on the rise. Women started wearing, for purposes of exercise, trousers more. I know. <laughs> And the sleeve supports came back. You also see wonderful e emphasis here on interesting details, on embroidery, on beadwork, on fun collars. I love the weird neck bows that you see throughout the 19th century. And that is the timeline. As you might have noticed, our 1890s dresses looked very similar to our 1830s dresses. That weird period in the middle of the bustle era where the dresses got slimmed down again is reminiscent of how Regency dresses slimmed down after the 18th century. Everything is in reaction, but it's also in reflection to what came before. How'd you do? How, how did you remember the timeline? Can anyone, let's give some guesses here. What was your guess? 1820. All right, we have a guess for 1825. What was the other guess that I heard? 1890s. 1832. Well, we have a winner. One year off. Well done, Larry. <laughs> So, throughout the 19th century, fashion influenced art and art influenced fashion. This, does anyone know this portrait here? John Singer Sargent, Portrait of Madame X. So this painting ruined John Singer Sargent's reputation for a good few years. It was seen as fully scandalous. She was far too immodest. The fact that he wouldn't reveal her name made people think she was a sex worker. In the original version of the portrait, her strap was down on her shoulder, which was far too much for Paris. His re reputation did in fact recover. We don't know about hers. <laughs> this middle illustration is by a name that you might recognize, Charles Dana Gibson. If you've ever heard the term Gibson girl thrown around, this is where it comes from. This man's illustrations, which were often put in newspapers, magazines, used as illustrations in books, other periodicals, defined a beauty standard for a generation. From the mid 1890s up until about 1920, if you wanted to be a beautiful young woman, you wanted to look like one of his drawings. And this third one is a piece from the 1830s. This is what we call a fashion plate. Fashion plates came out in magazines. You might have heard of like Paris à la mode, et cetera, et cetera. These magazines showed the style of the day. And if you were a young woman of means, you would take it to your dressmaker and say, hey, I like this middle style a lot. Let's, um, let's do it in a nice green. And he would make it for you. This was your Sears catalog of the 19th century. Of course, everyone had a lot to say about clothes then as now, particularly men. Um, these are from three very different parts of the 19th century. We can see some 1880s bustle era criticisms here with our lovely centaurs. 
a biting critique of the 1830s. And then this critique of the hoop skirt, which has always made me laugh, because hoop skirts squish. If this man fully believes that he has to walk on the rail of the stair to escort a lady down the stairs, he is admitting he has never been close enough to a lady to find out. <laughs> the media has also had a, um, a bit of an obsession with the 19th century for many, many, many years. Coming in here, how many of you's first, like, first association with corsetry is Gone with the Wind in that one scene? Yep. Gone with the Wind is an interesting film, to say the least, but has influenced, like, how we think about 19th century fashion since it came out in 1939. It is bombastic. It is larger than life. It is in your face. And it has some unforgettable costumes. Although the accuracy is dubious. Famously, she had an 18-inch waist, right? Mm -hmm. This did happen. However, you can find records of women's measurements from various like tailoring shops throughout the 19th century. The average corseted waist is the same as my uncorseted waist. Women weren't all that small. You also see here from 2005 Pride and Prejudice talking about a much earlier point in the 19th century. This movie is cinem is absolutely gorgeous in terms of its cinematography and keeps to a very muted, earthy, romantic palette that was popular in the early, early 19th century, but was not the only style. And then you have something like The Gilded Age from HBO. This is from 2022, and it is so fun. This isn't accurate, but it is in the spirit of the 1880s. The fun embroidery, the sheer pa panels, the geometric lines, all of this feels like something that people in the 1880s would have done and enjoyed if they'd had access to modern fabrics and modern technology. Playing, playing with fashion, playing with ideas of the past is how you make clothing that can help you tell a story. So, of course it won't kill you, but that's not to say that 19th century fashion was entirely harmless. <laughs> There was a lot here that was dangerous. Um, in his introduction, Larry mentioned an arsenic project. And that is an interesting little sub-story of the 19th century. Shields Green was a green pigment invented in 1775 by a German chemist. It produced a beautiful, vibrant Kelly Green that was light fast. It was inexpensive. It could be available to anyone. And it was arsenic. Now the thing about arsenic, if you're if I was saying, if I was say wearing an arsenic based gown, and I were to get warm, if I were to start sweating, that poison would leach directly into my bloodstream. Whoa. Yes. Um, the same was the same was true for wallpaper. Shields Green was used broadly as a dye for wallpaper, and it was lethal in humid environments. It was also at the same time used for pesticide. They used the exact same formula for clothes, walls, and killing pests. As early as the 1840s, there was research out showing how dangerous this dye was. However, it kept being used because it was inexpensive. In the 1870s and 80s, Many European countries started banning it or restricting who was allowed to work with it in the factories or restricting who was allowed to wear it, et cetera, et cetera, making it a lot harder to get a hold of in Europe. In America, well, the only, as of 1901, the only state that had banned Shields Green was Massachusetts. Shields Green only declined in the U.S. because a newer, cheaper green dye was invented, zinc green. 
the reason we stopped poisoning ourselves with arsenic in America was capitalism. <laughs> so this is something that was always in the back of my mind because it's fascinating. So the first time I went into the SOH SOHS archives and saw the textile collection, I was a little bit perturbed to see several mid-Victorian dresses in a vibrant Kelly green still hanging amongst the other garments. And I looked at um, Dr. Anna Sloan and I said, have these been tested for arsenic? And she said, should they be? I'm like, probably. So we did that out of sheer luck and happenstance. Um, this question was raised around the same time that a wo wonderful woman from the Oregon chapter of OSHA was running a study on toxins in Oregon museum collections. And she was so happy to be able to bring her XRF machine to our archive to test our garments for free. And since it was a study, we wouldn't get an OSHA violation. <laughs> I isolated five garments that I thought were likely suspects for, um, for the inclusion of arsenic. Of these five, four had arsenic present. As luck would have it though, none of them had enough arsenic still active to be considered a health, um, a health concern to the volunteers handling them by OSHA's standards. Interestingly enough, all five also tested positive for lead, which brings us into another little interesting deadly fact about Victorian fashion. Throughout most of the 19th century, a very heavy, rustly, taffeta-like silk was extremely popular. And one of the ways that you could make this very heavy silk affordable was lead. They would take a very thin lead filament and spin it with the silk fiber to weight the fibers. This did make it heavier. However, it also made it a lot more brittle. You can find newspapers from about the 1880s talking about when you are buying your silk, run your thumb down along the grain of it, and if it is weighted, it will shatter. This has become a nightmare for textile c conservation because this sh sh silk will shatter like glass over time. This is our last date, this dress. Did I hear 90s? All right. That's a very good observation. Um, this person said, this looks close to the Edwardian era, so it has to be close to the end of the 19th century. And you guys were correct. This is 1890s. You're getting good at this. <laughs> so the 19th century ends. We come into a new era. At the beginning, we still have that very Victorian sensibility the long skirts, the high necklines, the lace, the frills. Who can tell me what happens in the 1910s to make that impractical? It was the war, good job. <laughs> steel is no longer used for ladies undergarments. Steel is used for more practical concerns. <laughs> and then the 20s hits and suddenly there's a new generation of young women who do not remember the 19th century. They have different style, a different sensibility. They have a sense of youth to them that brings this very columnar, very boyish silhouette. And then the 30s hits, and then the 40s hits. Fashion is ever evolving. As you might have seen in the 19th century timeline, trends come and trends go, silhouettes change, world events influences the way that people dress. People in the 19th century were humans, just like us. They wanted to be stylish. They wanted to be comfortable. They wanted to be suited to the world in which they lived. And their clothing reflected that. And their clothing reflected them. And for me, the most intimate way to understand the past is to know what it feels like on your skin, to know what it feels like to go through your day in a corset and petticoats and hoop skirt The people who came before us are still here in the clothing they wore. 
And that is fashion in the 19th century. And I am open for questions. Yes. How does one sit? How does one sit? So, all right. The bustle is constructed. I'm going to go way back up to the top here to our foundation slide so we can talk about this. Yes. So you see these horizontal ribs. Those are your bits of hoop. Between them, just fabric. It squishes like an accordion. So you kind of just sit. 